In March 2019, we met in Paris for our second workshop, in which 16 masters and PhD students discussed representations and misrepresentations of Central Asia within and outside of academia. When we hear Central Asia, we almost automatically think of certain representations, such as the Great Silk Road. Here, on the Silk Road in Uzbekistan. Perhaps we also have images of a post-Soviet region in mind. Coming to 20 years after independence, the small Central Asian state of Kyrgyzstan remains one of the poorest parts of the former Soviet Union. Or of a mostly Muslim region. DW investigated why so many Tajiks leave their homes to join so-called Islamic State. Most representations of Central Asia are distorted snapshots of a more complex reality. They illustrate the imagination of Central Asia as particularly exotic, in development or dangerous. The presentations by the workshop's participants showed that we are frequently confronted with narratives, such as these grand narratives. They structure and thus define the limited knowledge available on the region. However, researchers in Central Asian studies can challenge some of these narratives and contribute to a more nuanced representation of Central Asia. Area studies and our field can be relevant, especially because it's so small and so, in a certain way, alternative. And it can play a role in, in here I quote, disturbing grand narratives. So somehow this concept of grand narratives got stuck in our heads and we thought, okay, well, that sounds interesting. Um, so we, the, the small um, Central Asian studies fields, could be a bit like this, uh, say for a biblical picture, this David fighting against the Goliath of, of grand narratives. Central Asia is a construct like any region. Its borders are usually defined according to an institution's or individual's interest. The European Union, for example, has a different definition than the UNESCO, gathering a range of countries and areas within the term of Central Asia suggests historical, cultural and political uniformity. This assumption is mostly based on the fact that Central Asian states had been for a long time an integral part of the Russian Empire, then the Soviet Empire, and that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they have naturally transformed into a region, sometimes called a Southeast post-Soviet region, or just Central Asian region. Can we though accept this historical evolution of Central Asia into a region? Does connectivity necessarily lead to the regionalization? The term region implies normally some homogeneity, like economic or geographical one, neither of which describes Central Asia. And as I said yesterday, regions are not a given reality, so it should be viewed as a political invention that could be constructed and deconstructed in the context of political transformations. The difficulty of respecting a region's diversity while structuring knowledge is a general problem of area studies. What is special about Central Asia, though, is that it is most often pictured not as a region of its own, but as the periphery of other wider spaces. Central Asia is on the margins of the post-Soviet space. Muslim countries, or Asia in general. This is problematic in two ways. Firstly, conceiving Central Asia as a periphery suggests that the region is of minor relevance. This is one of the reasons for the weak infrastructure of knowledge production on Central Asia. Accordingly, in-depth academic research and well-informed journalism on the region remain scarce. In France, uh, journalists, but also the public, I mean in general, they do not have, uh, most people do not know what Central Asia is, basically. So they have no kind of like, for me, even I see it when I talk with other journalists, they don't have any preconceived idea about Islam. I think very, very little people know that it's, uh, it's, um, that, that it's Muslim countries. But I think that, um, yeah, it's very hard when you have no narrative to like picture them a different way. Like people have no picture of Central Asia. Secondly, the imagined characteristics of the wider spaces create a set of associations. For example, Central Asia is associated with dictatorships and grey buildings, ideas which emerge from the post-Soviet narrative, or with religious extremism when perceived as a Muslim space. These are applied to Central Asia without critical engagement with the local situation. In two days of workshop, 
we found that similar distorted representations appear across the region and in different fields of research. We chose to grasp these misrepresentations in terms of underlying grand narratives. We talked a lot about grand narratives uh, in those two days and in our understanding grand narratives are stories that we tell ourselves about humanity or about indi individual societies. When discussing the concept of grand narratives during the workshop, the notion of Central Asia as a region in transition, naturally evolving towards a certain idea of modernity, came up many times. One of the very classical grand narratives is that of linear development over time. In that narrative, societies go from the backward society towards some kind of modernity. Um, these societies go through several stages throughout history, but they always have some kind of progress. In the case of Central Asia, if we take a stereotypical representation, that would be the progress from a um, authoritarian Soviet state via a post-Soviet state of being towards some kind of liberalism or democracy. Generally, grand narratives suggest simple solutions for complex problems. They are present in academic and non-academic knowledge about the region, and the misrepresentations they generate are often reproduced in media and can even have a negative effect on political decisions. On the other hand, grand narratives can also have certain benefits. Yesterday in the anthropology discussion, uh, it was said that grand narratives aren't always negative, they can be positive, uh, and I think that's reflective in my work, and it also can be a form of an analytical tool. With their simplifying effect, grand narratives help to structure our research, connect it to the broader academic context and make its results accessible to a wider public. Thus, with an awareness of the dangers of these narratives, we can make use of them in our research and in our communication with actors outside of academia. Reflecting on this during the workshop, we discussed how little our grand narratives we use should be. It's also just not about deconstructing um, or overcoming uh, grand narratives, but maybe also it is useful to, to see it as fixing grand narratives in a way. As early career researchers, we have a special responsibility to contribute to a more nuanced representation of the region. We are less embedded in pre-existing systems of thought than scholars at a later stage in their career might be. Also, in doing in-depth research, we want to engage with little narratives, a concept which Judith Bayer introduced in her keynote speech entitled On Little and Grand Narratives in Central Asia. Listening appropriately to these little narratives means paying attention to people's own stories and their own ways of reasoning, as Bayer argues, without directly placing them into pre-existing grand narratives. In particular, Considering that there is little ready-made knowledge on the region, we should offer a picture as close as possible to what little narratives tell us and try to be aware of the effects grand narratives can have. During my future search, my research assistants Imfira and I became the writers of such a life history ourselves by writing down what Baisa Pa had told me over the course of almost two years of field research. And she is my classificatory grandmother, um, so to speak, whose hands you see here in the picture. Um, and the outcome of, of this endeavor is, is a small Kyrgyz language book um, like this. Collecting our little narratives into wider pictures, we can offer alternative narratives, allowing to fix previous grand narratives. Opit says that ethnographers, when they're engaging in field work, are like pearl divers. Whereas those scholars who are working with these narratives at home, thus with the gathered pearls, who compare narratives from different cultural contexts, just as he did in his lecture, are like jewelers. What was found by one is put together by another. Changing one pearl, one little narrative, as I called it here, will have an impact on a grand narrative. Practitioners, such as journalists and politicians, are interested in our work. Thus, challenging or fixing grand narratives is more than just an intellectual exercise. There is a demand for alternative perspectives on Central Asia. Desk officers, for example, we can seem quite far from you when you're on the field, but um, desk officers on the ground in embassies, they're always happy to uh, collect such information. And it's uh, f 
for um, general information, which will somehow um, give an idea of the atmosphere we work on and in. Mm. Um, and it, it sort of contributes to decision making at the end of the day, even if it's not that specific story that will change um, French or German policies, it can contribute to having um, a better knowledge of the countries we work on uh, when we are based in Paris. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the main jobs of our embassies. We never really know what um, political attaches and, um, that work uh, close to the ambassador, what do they do? Well, they their work is cl closer to yours than you think. Transferring the knowledge we generate to other actors is a difficult exercise and bears the risk to be instrumentalised for the interest of somebody else. But we are motivated to engage with narratives and distortions on Central Asia and improve the knowledge on the region. In my master project I'm uh, basically very much interested in this, in the notion of agency among women in, women in Tajikistan. Uh, in particular, I'm very much interested in the notion of sexuality and sexual practices. In my PhD project, I focus on the relation between space, security and material culture in Mongolia, in rural and urban contexts. So in my research, I focus on how people actually interact with um, landscape and their environment and produce space in different ways. It's still a challenge to to see how we can disseminate um, our work, for example. And in this context, uh, we we talked about collaborating with um, journalists, for example, or other media outlets, and um, which might be very productive and um, a constructive way of disseminating um, academic knowledge uh, to a broader audience. We spoke about confronting all those issues, not only inside academia, but also outside. And uh, as a young scholar who is still not 100% sure whether I would like to pursue academic career or not, I find this extra academic, outside the academia engagement w very, very significant. We hope not only to shape the academic field, but also the general representation of the region.